Okay, so this is we're based in Wiltshire. Um, the class here, this is Georgie Map of UK, Reading here. Uh, uh, so we're just right on the edge of the, the Marlborough Downs. Uh, we have a silty clay loam soil over lower grey chalk, so we have quite a lot of clay in our topsoil. Um, the subsoil is anywhere between 20 centimetres and, and well over 70 centimetres deep. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity for it being difficult, um, but it can look really good uh, like that when you look after it. So we used to plough when the straw burning band, those remember those days, came in in the 90s, because um, we didn't know what to do with straw, and we were going organic at that stage as well, so we started ploughing it, and that was really didn't sit comfortably with, with me, and uh, so we, we ended up working out a system where we could uh, cultivate without ploughing. So we saw our plough in 2003, and uh, we don't have that problem of, uh, of, of creating concrete anymore. So i just quickly go through these, which is... Um, tell us a bit about us. So we started conversion in 1998. We're mostly cereals, uh, about half cereals, <coughs> half diverse lay on our farm. We have... Uh, an area of permanent pasture, um, some woodland, we have a pedigree angle, <coughs> and a separate herd. Um, we employ two people full time, really um, graduate trainee, and uh, the guy's been with us since he left school in the, in the 80s. Um, and, and we've got a summer student as, as well at, this, at the moment. So, this doesn't look very attractive, but just an introduction of what we've been doing. Um, and it, it wasn't a conscious approach to silver pastor, pastoral farming, but about five years ago, um, around our house actually, there were some pockets of, of woodland which I felt sort of were being excluded. I didn't know quite what to do with them. Uh, so I ran out of natural land and I said, look, uh, when I had a countryside stewardship, we weren't allowed to put cattle into the, to the uh, woodland. Is that still the case? And uh, about three days later, they, they rang back and said, um, we can't find anywhere where it sells you, you've got to exclude your cattle. I was like, oh, great, we can start putting our cattle into the, into the woodland. And we started in uh, little um, copses. Um, some places we hadn't fenced uh, these, these copses and we were putting electric fences around because I thought we had to keep the cattle out. And, and then actually when fences started to fall down, we put them behind the the trees instead of in front, and so we've been slowly including bits of woodland on our farm uh, for the cattle, and this provides lots of different opportunities really. I think just fundamentally, it, it's this idea of, um, for those who are familiar with the idea, of the farm organism, I felt that these bits of woodland were being excluded from the farm because I was sort of forgetting them because they weren't part of our farming process. And so uh, for, for me, it was just lovely to include them in that farm organism, in, in, including in the farm processes. But uh, they provide a lot of shelter from sun and rain. Um, uh, and this was uh, where the cattle were a few weeks ago when it rained and rained and rained. And there's a big 45 hectare field beside. And so we were able to fence this little bit um, uh, the cops in so that it just provides some, some cover and and it looks pretty rough but we did this last year in the same patch and it grows back and uh, it recovers very quickly um, and actually we've been spreading wildflower seeds and, and diverse low seeds in the bottom this year because the cattle won't be in there next year so uh, it'll actually regenerate it and um, so I, I feel it's a, a positive opening up I've had um, some conversations with some ecologists and other people recently about, about this, and one of them going, oh, what are you doing? You know, you're going to be damaging your hedges, and they were really, and I said, well, we're not leaving them in the, the whole time. It's just passing through, you know, it's part of, of, of what we do. And now, and, and I think it's really valuable. Uh, and actually, there's a, there's a hedge around the outside, and we'll probably coppice up this winter, because uh, next year it won't be raised, as I just mentioned. And so it gives the, uh, the, the hedge an opportunity to, to regenerate at that stage. So, so I think it, it provides uh, actually so much more opportunity for, for, for 
developing the, the woodland. And we're looking, uh, we've got quite a bit of farm woodland scheme which was planted in 1990, um, areas on the farm, and they're about to come out of the uh, subsidy system, system, so just coming up to the 30 year um, in which we've got paid and we couldn't put animals in. So when that's passed, we'll be looking to put up um, cattle into to those areas as well, uh, and perhaps thin them in a way that becomes, you know, as, as uh, Joe was talking earlier, becomes more suitable for grazing underneath the trees. And, and uh, so I think, you know, that's probably going to be part of my thinking. Uh, <laughs> this isn't to do with um, zero pastoral farming, but uh, we put some bird boxes in this, and um, the area the previous photo, and one of the uh, fronts fell off. This is all plastic string, mm. and which is hideous, but I have a bit of a thing about plastic. And uh, birds seem really good at collecting plastic to, to make nests from it. So <laughs> uh, I'm not sure this is really a, a principle I want to, uh, to make the most of, but, um, but it's just a, a bit of a horrible thought about how much plastic pollution is on the farm, and we make a real effort to, to pick it up and, and take it away. Um, it's right next door to a barn, actually, which has been storing straw for, for many years and hay, so that's why there's bits of plastic there, but uh, just a little side thought. So one of the things uh, we've done this winter, so you can see this is, uh, this is two photos. Um, so on this side, you can see there's a track and uh, grass margin on either side uh, and large, large fields to the side of those. So there's no hedge in this situation. Um, and we use a wood chip uh, or wood dust, really, sawdust as a byproduct from um, the timber industry to bed our cattle on. Uh, I, ultimately, I want to produce our own. And so, part of what we've been doing uh, last winter was buying um, willow sticks and just sticking them in the ground as a way of uh, producing um, a hedgerow, which we, initially I was thinking would just coppice for, for wood chip. And actually now, having um, been listening to lots of silver pastoral people, what we'll do, so this is more of a close-up, is, um, is put the electric fence on the track side of the um, willow in a few years' time when cattle come down to graze that field. And then the cattle can graze the, the willow as well. So uh, suddenly it's becoming more useful. And it'll provide shade too. So multi-use. So this is perhaps a... Uh, this is a side of another field, we've done the same thing, so here you can see the, the willow sticks. Um, we've had a lot of deer damage um, on these willows, but uh, I think they're mostly, um, it's probably 95% still there, even some of the ones that have been scratched uh, and rubbed on. Um, Which is, you've not put any protection at all? Nothing at all. Nothing. No, no uh, part of my hate of plastic is trying to find systems where we don't need to use it. And uh, so I, I'm happy to take a loss rather than use or buy plastic. So uh, we go and fill, it, fill in the gaps next year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, interesting, we, we tried two lengths as well. So we got this from a guy, um, oh, back in the show somewhere, I can't remember where he is now, um, who sells organic willow sticks. And uh, I wanted to buy short ones of two feet, which are sort of, he insisted, but I needed longer ones at three feet, because he was worried about the competition with the grass. Uh, so we tried both, and they both look fine. Uh, actually, I wonder whether the shorter ones are better, because they're hidden from the deer more, mm -hmm. bizarrely. Um, but we'll know next winter, really, when the grass um, goes down, and, and uh, we can see clearly what, what, uh, what's happened. Um, what varieties do you get from? They're uh, Swedish variety. Um, three, they're a mixture of varieties from uh, Sweden, I think. They were the only organic guy I could find. Um, there were lots of other varieties, uh, English ones and other things, but um, he seems to persuade me to buy that one. Let's see. Uh, actually, the next year we're going to do a similar thing. I was wanting to do it, uh, looking or trying, thinking about doing it with hazel. <coughs> So we have a lot of hazel coppice on our farm um, uh, of wood that's called the withy bed uh, from the time when they used to make uh, withies uh, 
sheep hurdles out of Hazel. And so Hazel clearly worked very well on the farm. It's been um, selected in the past. And so I just thought, well, actually, we don't really tend to farm willow on our farm because we don't have, because of the chalk, we don't have uh, um, big rivers or anything. So, so actually, I think uh, we'll use Hazel next year. <coughs> Just a couple of other We've got a couple of projects uh, running with Woodland Trust. Um, there's Woodland here, <coughs> which uh, had a hectare in the middle, which in the 70s, the previous farmer planted this wood for shooting. Uh, so there was a pheasant pen this end and, and, and so on. Um, anyway, so it's just been grass for, for quite a while. And um, so again, we've been planting a mixture of native species uh, in this area with the idea of processing it in uh, few years time for woodchip again and uh, they will take in very well despite the uh, dry <coughs> spring and, um, or dry summer last year. Um, actually someone, um, a farmer many years ago um, gave, told me a phrase about planting trees. I don't know whether anyone knows this phrase because I've been trying to find out what it is. But if you plant trees in December they're something like they're sure to fr thrive and you plant them you know, in January, they, they don't. <laughs> that clearly doesn't rhyme. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, it was a, it was it always stuck in my head, and so we always plant trees before the first of January now, and uh, and it's so much better uh, than if you know when I had planted uh, the old hedge or whatever um, later. Uh, it just gives them time to establish up. So you're not. I, I see. Spirals, canes, guards are all mentioned up there, but you're not using any of that. We did on this one, yes. So this was planted uh, 18 months ago, and uh, we used guards that we had, when we planted this farm woodland scheme in 1990, uh, we removed all the guards about 10 years after the trees had established, so we had this big pile of guards, and so we've been reusing all those guards. Uh, and actually, the Woodland Trust wouldn't um, exchange the guards for anything. They said, sorry, it's just too complicated. So I've got all the new guards <laughs> stood up. Um, if anyone wants to buy some new guards? <laughs> uh, we did use the spirals, actually, because we had some shorter and um, some base fires and hazel. Um, uh, but, but generally, I mean, the other thing is about spraying underneath um, hedges. Uh, a few conversations about that recently. We, um, we've got quite large fields, and since 2000, when for the countryside stewardship scheme, we we replanted and regenerated um, 15, 17 kilometres of, of woodland around the farm. And we were told then you've got to spray underneath when you plant the, the, the hedges because you know the grass competition will be too much and they'll die and they won't survive most of the time. I was just talking to someone yesterday about it, and, and actually I think probably, I mean we didn't have a problem, you know, the hedges are all thriving, they're all looking great. Um, I think possibly what it is, is if, if you're farming with fertiliser, and you, the fertiliser goes in the hedge, then the grass will be much more competitive against the hedge, because it's been fertilised. And I guess because we're not doing that, uh, then the, the hedge gets a chance to be established and, and, and get away. Maybe. Anyway, so this is um, part of, uh, so again, you know, these um, bits of uh, woodland here, we will be looking to, um, the one you saw the photographs of is this one here, actually. So you can see there's just big um, fields around, but it provides, so we've been strip grazing, actually rotational grazing this field, and so we've been taking little elbows out uh, to get to the, to the cover here. Um, in order to give the, the, the cattle some, some cover. We've also, uh, as part of this planting, we've been putting in um, uh, rows of trees around the farm as well. So this is something we haven't yet done, but we've got funding to do. So uh, much uh, like Stephen's farm, we're going to, uh, as a trial, uh, we've got a seven hectare field here, which uh, initially we're going to plant straight tree lines, uh, they're 27 metres apart, and uh, it was going to be apples, pears and plums, 
Uh, we're now going to put them in curves like this and probably have a totem pole or something in the middle and make a little feature as a retirement project, perhaps mine. <laughs> um, and uh, it's going to be mostly apples, I think, now, because that's probably what people want to, to buy. Uh, and it'll probably be for juicing and um, fruit. So we work with a Japanese organisation called Shumei. I don't know whether you've any, any come across it. And uh, so it's going to be a joint venture with them um, with regard to pruning they have this amazing way of pruning apple trees, which appeals, and uh, they're also very keen on um, juicing the apples. So. What was the name of the apple, sorry? Shumei, S-H-U-M-E-I. Mm. So they grow vegetables on our farm as a sort of project on their own, but they'd like to be involved with this. So health is, is really the, the one key word that I think everything we do on a farm, producing the food, it, it's all about uh, creating health. But there's, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the impact about what we do as well. Um, and one thing that's been really niggling me for the past six months is uh, methane. And um, as any cow with, uh, any cow, any farmer with cows, um, probably feel a little bit on the back foot. And I've been sort of scratching my head and thinking, you know, what am I going to um, do about this? Anyway, so I did, uh, some of you I know were, at the um, agroecology event last week, a uh, uh, carbon audit a couple of weeks ago, and I'm very pleased, uh, really surprised, that it came out so positive. So, I'll just quickly show you that. So, the green is the sequestration, and the brown is what we emit. So, those are the numbers. So, actually, if we just look at the emissions to start with, so indeed, uh, livestock. Uh, accounts for nearly all the emissions, so two quarters of the emissions. Uh, don't use any of those. This is emissions from the crops, so when the residues from the crops break down, they make some nitrogen oxide. Uh, this is uh, capital items of the tractors, so that's embedded carbon in the machinery. Uh, that's the fuel we use during the year. Um, and that's uh, capital I think. Um, our crops are sold ex-farmers, we don't have any haulage for, um, for the crops. So then if you move over to sector station, so the field margins indeed, uh, they produce a little bit, uh, store a bit of carbon. Um, woodlands and hedgerows, they make that rebalance. So this is all growth, it's not what's stored there, it's what's added each year. Uh, so the woodlands and hedgerows, they rebalance about half of the, the livestock emissions. But it's actually the soil where we can actually do the most good. And so this, um, the, uh, we, the reason I can get to this figure is because when we started organic conversion, we uh, took quite a few soil samples in various fields before they went into conversion. I wish we'd done the whole farm now, but it was an expensive process. And, uh, and at the time, I couldn't see the value. So does this include the methane and the oxides and nitrogen? The what, sorry? Methane and ox oxides and yes. nitrogen? Yes, it's, all, it's CO2 equivalent, so they're all converted to, to, to CO2. Um, yeah, but so, so because I know what the carbon, uh, the organic matter levels were in, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, late 1990s, uh, I can do rough calculations for, because I'm, we're doing extensive uh, soil organic matter testing now, so I know what the change is. And, and from that change, we can... Uh, what has changed? It's about, uh, on the, uh, the cropped fields, 0.27% oh. per year. Which sounds a lot, and it is. Ooh, so, uh, 0.27. So it's a lot of nitrogen, uh, a lot of carbon. And, but even interestingly, so I just for for the hell of it, I went back and um, looked uh, at, at the balance. If I was a factor of ten out, so just for hypothetically, and this was still only here somewhere. So we because the a small amount of carbon in the soil has such a big effect, 
it, it really has a, um, a big impact on this equation. Richard, mm. when, when the soil is very differentiation between the cropping phase and the grass phase, because they're, they're all in there together, aren't they? And that's yeah, all yes, there. yeah. Uh, Proportionally. Well, I haven't looked at that because the, um, the period is long enough to include. We've sampled lots of different fields, so they'll be in different phases. Uh, and so it's a rough calculation. Uh, not full, it's a full rotational balance. Yeah, so it, it, it's across different. I mean, actually, the um, I suppose the initial. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked at the rotational ones, but there will be one. Is this, uh, is this using the. Uh, this is a farm carbon yeah. cutting toolkit, uh, which is which is great. And, and on balance, how much of that soil organic matter is being retained at 0 0.27? So you started on, on the fields you tested? Yes, yeah, so, so it depends so much on the field. So it yeah. varies across the farm, and you'll see some more variations in there. So on some of the fields, uh, we were 2 point something percent. Yeah. And some of the fields were, or well, one particular, there was a five. So the five one I know is now eight. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a sort of doubling effect. But uh, it, it's, you know, it depends on the field. Uh, and the are, we, are we okay to share these slides with people sure. afterwards? Yeah. I'm just aware of the time. Yeah, I might want to take a long time. Yeah, no, it's good. It's <laughs> carry on. <laughs> Did you include the carbon cost of the animal feed? What animal feed? And isn't this got some great livestock on it? Yes. So there's no, you're not using any concentrate? Don't buy anything. Right. You can so access the tool if you want to look at it. It's um, yes. really available, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so it's all, it's all grass-fed um, yeah. cattle. Yeah. Uh, some of the fattens get a little bit of uh, cereal that is, is clean there to the cereal that we sell. Uh, but that's a recycling process, nothing more. Um, in fact, the quality of the forage is probably better than the cereals that we're just using up. Yeah. So we, it, we're fundamentally a closed farm. Yeah. That's, it. That's cool. Something else I want to show you, so we're involved with another project which is called Landwise. It's um, Joe Clark at Reading University who's set this up. Um, it's across the whole Thames Catman area. And uh, so um, CH Centre for uh, Ecology and Hydrology have come and done some soil samples with us in uh, March, I think it was. So I just, I'll just slowly explain these slides because I need to remember what they are as well. So this is looking at two fields. Uh, one of the things we didn't look at was the, the um, soil organic matter levels in permanent pasture because we just didn't think it would be of interest at the time. But this does, this compares, so the um, uh, trafficked and untrafficked, and GR is for us, and uh, YTS is us, and uh, I think, um, and this is the woodland. So uh, this is looking at porosity, and then this is looking at organic matter. So here we are, have the grassland that's untrafficked, uh, and that's great. Um, really high. I hope they've done their analysis correctly. They ought to be. They're, <laughs> they're good scientists. So, um, again, I'm rather surprised at that high level. Uh, the trafficked area, so this will be around the gateways, places where the cattle stand, uh, is a little bit lower, as you'd expect, and that's part of, this is looking at uh, natural flood management. Um, so that's, that's part of what we're looking at. Um, but what was really surprising is we went into the old woodland next door. I mean, it's at least 100, 200 years old. There's old root trees in there. And the organic matter was much le less than in the pasture. And so I think there's actually a big opportunity for putting the cattle in this woodland, which hasn't you know, been grazed for a long time. Actually, one of the other things that inspired me to you know, put the cattle in was my mother, um, when my parents bought the farm, I remember her saying several times, well, when we came here, that the previous farmer had cattle in the woodlands. You know, that he always did. That was what he did. And it always sat in my head, and I thought that was a strange thing, because we've never done it since, and ecologists always frowned on it in the 90s. Uh, and actually, but they're you know, all encouraging it now, which is great. And so um, I think that you know, we can store much more carbon in the soil in the woodlands, and I think we've been hearing a bit about that today already. 
uh, by adding cattle to, to, to the to the woodlands and grazing them. So basically, cows. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>